Green Rising, my friends. Hey there, what's going on? Good to see you to the most beautiful subscribers in the known Milky Way galaxy. If you're brand new here, pull up a chair, get in, jump on in. It's going to be a doozy today. Jump in. We got much, so let's move fast. Bitcoins, a bit of a pullback, which you see sometimes as it hits an all-time high, which is healthy. You want a bit of a pullback and then to go ahead and punch past that 67,000 or so. So this is healthy. Don't worry about any of this in the market. Binance Coin had a little bit more of a pullback, it seems. Oh, no, not quite, not quite. But you see Cardano has kind of just been coiled, waiting. So it has shot up a lot. And uh, Solana has passed XRP in his market cap because XRP has kind of been also kind of coiling while Solana has been going up with Ethereum and Bitcoin. We'll keep an eye on things as we go through. It is a very healthy market. Bitcoin's dominance has come down a little bit as individuals. Oh, okay. The free airdrops on here. We'll be talking about these really soon. Free airdrops. The, as the money will flow out of Bitcoin to some of the other projects, the other cryptocurrencies, the altcoins, you will see that dominance come down a little bit. The market cap for the entire market is at $2.56 trillion dollars. Presently, stock market did pretty good today. S&P and the NASDAQ were positive. The Dow was just slightly down. Um, Tesla had a great day, getting close to his all-time highs. Probably either nipped it today is at 900 at one point, but now it's at, now I bet a lot of people had sale orders at 900 because they got in around that price. And so it, it um, ended today at $894. Look like Home Depot also had a good day. I think we talked about that, how the White House was going to keep all these places open. Yeah, 24. Yeah, we talked about Ethereum burn almost close to 600,000. Here, you know, we're all about that positivity, and that includes sending messages via electronic means to people who are meaningful to us in life. And so if someone has touched you in a way that has made you feel special, then um, send them. Write, a, write something about them in the comment section for this video and say, hey, take a look at what I wrote about you. Bombshell leak reveals China's new hypersonic weapon, Game Changer. So China made a major leap in its nuclear capable weapons technology program, testing a missile with capabilities that have caught political adversaries by complete surprise. According to a leak, the Chinese Communist Party tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile in August that went around the globe before making its way towards the intended target. And it flew as opposed to ballistic missiles that will fly up into orbit and come down orbital flight. Um, these hypersonic missiles are able to fly into low orbit and then maneuver their way around. And so I don't think we are... As surprised that they're saying, after cruising through low orbit space, the missile ultimately missed the target by some 38 kilometers. Three people briefed on the intelligence told the paper. So, you know, this talking about this is a game changer. This is a Sputnik moment. And if you, for those who are not too clear or understand what that reference means is when the Soviet Union in the 1950s launched a orbital missile, the first orbital missile that was able to put something in orbit and transmit back, which was the Sputnik satellite, first man-made object that we know of, put into orbit. And so it, quote-unquote, surprised America because, you know, it's a bit of the space, but also saying, hey, we got missiles that can fly in space and leave things. You know, we can also find missiles to fly in space and land on your country as well, is the other part of the equation. And that's why. So China was saying this wasn't a missile, it was a hyperglide vehicle. But, you know, we test our hyperglide vehicles and we know that we're getting them ready to be used as missiles. <laughs> so that's what we say. Oh, y'all got y'all got one, too, because we've been testing our hyperglide vehicles, which are vehicles that can fly faster than Mach 6, I believe. But faster than Mach 6 hyper, hypersonic speed. So. 
a lot of this is just talking about how it makes it uh, more difficult for our, our our conventional missile defense systems that were targeted towards more ballistic missiles that we were able to versus these hypersonic lower flying maneuverable missiles. But like I said, we're going to come out with some, you know, of course, they're trying to do this as they show this aggression towards Taiwan to say, hey, if we do push up on Taiwan, y'all sit still because we could send thousands of these hypersonic glide vehicles towards your country if necessary. And so they've been ramping up their uh, nuclear warheads, ramping up. They have their own missile force. These are all things we discussed before. They have their own, like we have a Marines, Navy, Air Force. They have a Marines, I think they have Marines, Air Force, Navy, Army, and missile force. Like we got Space Force, they got missile force. So we got the public health sector and Coast Guard as well. You know, we, we, we have, uh, I don't know if they have, all those are even more than we have in terms of that regard. Bigger country. So this is not good news. We will see what our, but like anything, once you create a offense, the your adversary will create a defense. And then it's, you know, escalating uh, infinite gain in that regard. We accidentally solved the flu. Now what? So... I'll just read the numbers to you. Perhaps the oddest consolation prize of America's crushing protracted battle with the coronavirus is the knowledge that flu season, as we have long known it, does not have to exist. It's easy to think of the flu as an immutable fact of winter life, more inconvenienced than calamity. But every year on average, it sickens roughly 30 million Americans and kills more than 30,000. Though the numbers vary widely season to season, the elderly, the poor and people of color are all overrepresented among the casualties. By some estimates, the disease annual economic cost amounts to nearly 90 billion dollars U.S. We accept this when we think about it as the way things are. Except that this past year, things were different during the 2020 21 flu season. The United States recorded only about 2,000 cases, 17,000 times fewer than 35 million recorded the season before. 2,000 cases, total cases of flu versus 35 million a year before. That season, the flu killed 199 children in the year that we had 35 million. This season, as far as we know, it killed one. We've looked for flu in communities and doctor's office, University of Michigan, go blue. You know how we keep it. You, you, you know, listen to what Dr. Martin must say, epidemiologists. But no, they. So what do we do? You know, we know now because of the coronavirus that taking these, even if they say, even though they were inconsistent, which was masking, distinct, social distancing, remote working and learning, Limiting, limiting indoor social gatherings, the, the flu is less transmissible than coronavirus. And because we were doing so much for coronavirus, like we said, we accidentally say, oh, we just wiped out the flu, basically. And also uh, other uh, respiratory illnesses, parainfluenza, RSV, rhinovirus, adenovirus. We did away with a lot of respiratory illnesses that have devastated that, you know, as someone who has worked in the medical field, you see it'd be like I said, you just think, oh, this is what it is. But now we realize, oh, it doesn't have to be this way. Now, of course, he said we can't go into the measures we've taken. It can't be any type of lockdown, even though we didn't truly have any type of lockdowns here in the United States. You know, in reality, China supposedly had lockdowns. You saw what was going on there. But being smarter about what how we go forward, they saying like having um, circuit breakers where if we know it's starting to be transmitted in this school, maybe going to remote learning for a week to try to break the rates of transmission amongst individuals. You know, if you're going to be in a, um, a tight social place around people, you know, wearing so people should wear masks. It, you know, the difference between like the coronavirus and the flu is that you're symptomatic 
when you're showing symptoms. Like, I'm sorry, you're infectious when you're symptomatic, when you're showing symptoms. So if you see somebody with the peaky eyes and the sneeze and the coughing, yeah, they should be wearing a mask because they know they can now block their droplets from getting on other people. But you know how this country is and how people are going to act. This is what I said. They said we're going to wear a mask all the time. No, but just being smart saying, okay, I'm sick. First off, they're talking about here, like, if you're sick, don't go around other people. If you know you're sick, don't go around other people. Be smart about it. The same way you wouldn't, you would be fearful to go around other people thinking you may have the coronavirus if you was all uh, coughing and stuff. You'd be like, oh, you know, you would know how people would be staring at you and wouldn't want to be around you. You know, if you're sick, don't go around other people. If, if, you're not sure if it's a little bit of uncertainty, wear a mask in that case. Um, if you're going to be in a crowded place, like in a movie theater or something, you may just, during cold and flu seasons when it's, you know, the rates are up, we may have like, um, now they do the pollen report and the rain and precipitation may say, hey, the rates of flu are at a certain blah, blah, blah level. And you know, okay, if I'm going to be out, I might want to throw a mask on just in case, you know, besides if I'm sick. Also making it to where you're not punished for staying home if you're sick from school or work. All these things, you know, are brought up in this article, which makes sense. Because, you know, 30-some thousand people dying. Now, granted, can we get it down to, I don't even know what the numbers of death were. We had less than 2,000 people with flu. How many did they, did they say were, um, did, or didn't say about the uh, mortality in it? But if we can reduce that by even just 20, 30, 40, 50 percent by being somewhat smart, man, you know, something to think about. The El Salvadorians are now selling way more U.S. dollars to buy Bitcoin. So it looked like it's working there, and especially now as the Bitcoin starts to shoot up. But a lot of people in, in, in El Salvador are taking their money and trans... Um, transferring into bitcoin and you know for, for example they said they think like uh, like half the citizens have downloaded the wallet where before that 70 percent of the com of the country was unquote unquote unbanked not in the conventional sense but you got a lot of people who have downloaded the wallet now and you know this guy talked about building a veterinary hospital I, I, some other research i found lately said the president there uh, they he got rid of or fired the Supreme Court, and I guess they're only supposed to do one term as a president in um, El Salvador, but he's trying to get the Constitution rewritten so he can run for re-election. You know, these are the kind of things that make you wonder, is this, you know, could it be that it was corrupt and he's trying to make these changes to make things better and people agree, or, you know, he's a strong man, so we're not going to be too hype with the with how he um uh, backs bitcoin but oh wow pension fund i didn't go come on look at this pension fund for texas firefighters reportedly allocates 25 million dollars to bitcoin and ether smart so the el salvadorians seem like they're making out they're they're becoming digitized compared to other countries by far We'll see how this goes in the future. I think it's going to end out really well for them. You know, that'd be crazy if they like go from, you know, uh, being a country looked at as, I don't even know if they even would be called it like developing <laughs> in a sense, but uh, to being a very super industrialized, wealthy country, you know, because that's what happened for a lot of these countries in the um, Arabian Peninsula is when they got that oil money, they went from being ignored by the vast majority of the world will be left to themselves to now become international destinations. So get rich and things happen for you. Is Bitcoin as the fourth industrial re revolution a matter of debate? <coughs> Sorry. Bitcoin for long has been scrutinized for the benefits and risk it poses in terms of economic growth, financial system stability and the welfare of society. While some call it the biggest financial innovation of the fourth industrial revolution, others believe in simply banning it. You can't ban Bitcoin. Now, I think the fourth industrial revolution is the information age, as this will probably hopefully be known or not be known. We're the kings of the information age here amongst the familia. The... It, it's basically saying that at the end of the day, you're going to be a country that 
and then, you know, just interviewing with this guy, Brock Pierce, who was um, one of the co-founders or you have Tether, which is a stable coin. It has, you know, it's history and um, it is, but it is, I think maybe the first stable coin and it's still probably the biggest by volume. And so, you know, stable coin. So he all in on the old El Salvador. Wow. This guy, you know, doesn't make sense. This, this, this quote from this guy who is kind of like the alternative view to this article of the future, how important Bitcoin is going to be to the future of the financial system and how it's going to underwrite the information. It would not just necessarily Bitcoin, but cryptocurrencies will help the information age with the smoothness of transitions. As we talked before, these contracts talking to each other and these uh, artificial intelligence and able to facilitate that in a immutable, verified way, you know, that's, uh, and that's another article we'll talk about soon that the, Associated Press is using Chainlink to verify their stories, like in terms of sports scores, weathers is oracles on their um to send information around. So the future is coming. Been trying to say it. I hope everybody listening they jumping on in and getting involved. Because we said yesterday we go be rich. You make some right decisions. So this guy, the alternative view, said private digital money is nothing new. Most Money has been produced privately and in a digital form for decades. A great deal of what you read about the innovative wonders of cryptocurrency is smoke and mirrors. Read my latest. And in there he said, um, what it was some it was something silly. I can't I can't find. But it was like, oh, something like, oh yeah, here we go. And in, in there he talked about more so that banks have been reliable keepers of ledgers for centuries. The banks have been so good to us. How could we not trust them? I was like, you know, this guy is just in the pockets of, of big finance. So, yeah, Bitcoin is going to be a and, and cryptocurrencies are going to be a tremendous part of the next it, it forever. As long as it, this society and this world exists as the way it does, you know, um, it will be a part going forward. So it's still pretty early. Get in where you fit in. With that said. I love you. You love you. And God loves us. And that's all that matters.